global temperatures are getting warmer. Glaciers are melting. Sea levels are rising. Scientists agree that increasing carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere are changing our climate. Whoa. For some, where those gases are coming from is still a matter of debate. Planes, cars, and industry are commonly accepted as the main culprits. But volcanic eruptions are also known to throw huge amounts of gas into the atmosphere. I'm making it my mission to climb into one of the world's most active volcanoes to find out if those gases are contributing to climate change. It blows me away every time I see this many cars. And this is just one highway in one city. How much carbon dioxide are we putting into the atmosphere? But it's not just us. There are other more natural sources of greenhouse gas as well. Things such as melting permafrost and cow farts, believe it or not. Some people even say that the volcanoes of the world are creating more greenhouse gas than all of the human activity combined. How do you respond to people who are, I don't even use the word skeptic, because skeptic is not the right word. The deniers, deniers are better Deniers who, who are claiming volcanoes contribute yeah. more uh, greenhouse gases than all of the industrialized countries put together. What we're dealing here with is, is a deeply held belief system. Uh, some, it could have elements of political persuasion. They're usually sort of predisposed to believe anything that means you don't have to do anything, don't have to take action, right? So if it's just volcanoes, well, there's nothing we can do about that, so that's fine. Just let the volcanoes go off and nature will take care of itself, you know? At any given time, there are 50 to 60 active volcanoes around the world. Eruptions expel huge amounts of gas into the atmosphere, which some believe is leading to climate change. I don't know if I buy that, but it's something I really need to check out, and I know just the place. My curiosity brings me to the nation of Vanuatu. It's a small archipelago of about 80 islands in the South Pacific Ocean. I've landed in the capital of Port Vila, but my final destination is the neighboring island of Ambrum, the home of one of the world's most active volcanoes. The weather there is notoriously awful. There's volcanic gas, there's acid rain, and, of course, the threat is always there for a larger eruption. So it's not the most hospitable place on Earth. I know this area of the world well. I even got married in 2006 on the lip of an exploding volcano in Vanuatu. That's where we're getting married, right at the top of the Yasser. And it's real active today. Now I'm going to an even more active and more remote volcano on the island of Ambra. I'm getting some help on this expedition. Sarah. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Vanuatu. Sarah Hoffritz is an accomplished young geologist from Denmark. She has the equipment to help us determine how much dangerous gas the volcano is emitting and if it's contributing to climate change. Frequent eruptions on Ambram create weather conditions that make flying to the island a challenge. It looks like we've lucked out with a clear day. The trick is, is it going to be clear on Ambra? Typically in the places shrouded in cloud a lot of the time. So I've got my fingers crossed. I'm very hopeful. So far, so good. I'm uh, very interested in seeing how nature is behaving in this setting. It's going to be cool. There are two active volcanic cones on this island, Mount Benbo and Mount Maroom. Over the past decade, there's been an increase in emissions of volcanic gases from both of them. In 2009, Approximately 15,000 tons of sulfur dioxide was emitted into the atmosphere in one day. Despite the danger of these frequent eruptions, almost 9,000 people live on the island of Ambram. To them, the volcano is a part of life. Before we head to the summit, Sarah and I want to gauge the effect the volcano is having on the local village of Endu. Is this your drinking water? Yeah. This water has a source right up on the mountain. And is it from a well? No. Or a spring? Spring water. Spring water. Yeah. yeah. During major explosive eruptions, huge amounts of volcanic gas, including sulfur dioxide, get ejected into the atmosphere. Large clouds can pollute the air downwind of the volcano, 
and when mixed with moisture, can lead to acid rain. This contamination has harmful effects on water supplies for people, plants, and animals. Sarah came equipped to determine if this community is at risk. Today, we're testing the drinking water. What do we have here? This is a conductivity meter, and that will tell me how many ions in the water. 270. Yeah, 270 microsiemens. So that means there definitely is some ions in the water. Very likely some sulfur and some uh, fluorine. Which is so rather high. To put it into perspective, pure drinking water typically contains less than five microsiemens of concentrated minerals. This town's water is over 50 times that amount. Drinking contaminated water can damage teeth and bones. A recent government of Vanuatu report predicts a dire future for the island as future eruptions and resulting contamination from acid rain is almost certain. The brooding outline of the volcano is nearly always shrouded in gas and cloud. When we have a volcano that's active like Abramus, I want to see how much sulfur dioxide and how much carbon dioxide is being emitted at the volcano. We know volcanic eruptions emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but enough to cause climate change? It's time to find out. Awesome. For the next five days, we'll be eating, sleeping, and working at the summit of this active volcano. This is about as far away from civilization as it gets. Well, welcome to Madam. <laughs> yeah, that's your exactly. Line. This that's is your line. Line. Yeah. <laughs> The summit of a volcano is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. The air is heavy with a mixture of gases, and when inhaled, it can be deadly. The conditions up here are so bad, I'd say the only place you'd find them is on another planet. Our guide is Jeff Mackley, nicknamed Danger Man. He was the first person to explore the depths of this volcano. The camp looks like it's taken a beating. Hey, um, George. Yes? Uh, this is your tent? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's unbelievable. When you've got hurricane force winds uh, mixed with very sharp gravel and high strength sulfuric acid, it's like somebody firing a fire hose full of gravel and sulfuric acid at you, and that can go on for a week. The condition of this tent is a testament to what the weather can really be like up here. Extremely high winds, sandblasting with all this volcanic ash and gravel. And of course, the acid in the atmosphere has weakened this material down to nothing. It may be dangerous at the summit, but tomorrow, we'll climb down into the belly of the beast. You can feel the heat all the way from up here. It's very violent. Boiling pools of lava and seemingly endless plumes of gas await us at the bottom of the crater. But I need to get closer to the volcano to find out more about the gases it's emitting. And that's where the real danger is. Ah! Very few volcanoes are capable of producing the amount of gas that Ambram can. There are several vents here that are all vigorously degassing hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen fluoride. Are these dangerous gases contributing to our warming planet? Sarah has the latest technology to measure just that. She's using a fly speck to measure the sulfur dioxide levels in the air at Ambram. So now it's scanning through the plume going from over here and scanning the way through. This data will reflect the amount of toxic SO2 at the summit and help us understand if and how this contributes to climate change. But to get more data, we'll have to go straight to the source. Sarah is getting her chance to go into the volcano, so this is gonna be really, really fun. But today, visibility is poor and I'm hoping it doesn't get any worse. Oh. The entire crater right now is completely filled with gas. But let's try and see if it clears up. Yeah. Yep. All right. Are you good to go? I feel so. For even the most experienced climber, this descent is a challenge. Nice steady creeper. Brad, our guide, will be leading us down the tricky descent, and I'll be following behind Sarah. With almost a straight drop of 1,200 feet to the bottom, a lot could go wrong. To get down to the bottom, it's so deep that the ropes just are not gonna be long enough, so we have to do a multi-stage rappel in three different steps. 
Can you imagine all this used to be covered by rock and then it had this big explosion and now we're just in the hole of it. Now that Sarah has safely reached the 100 yard ledge, I can start my descent. This is insane. It's beautiful. You know, everything around here is trying to kill you, but apart from that, it's great. The weather is closing in making it hard to see where we're climbing. Not feeling very confident about this. Brad calls off the climb. It's too dangerous. The visibility has gotten so poor that we'd be doing the descent virtually blind. Our visit to the crater will have to wait. Maybe next time. Visibility has dropped down tremendously, which is never a good thing around here. And I'm starting to feel some drizzle coming in, which usually leads to torrential rains <laughs> and storms. You can hear the roar of the wind and the gravel being brought towards you. And then your tent just violently shakes. And it just keeps battering and battering and battering your tent until, you know, bit by bit, there might be something that comes loose. An unexpected storm has delayed our mission. We need to seal that corner up too, or we'll lose that. We've done everything we can to secure our tents. Now we just need to hunker down and ride out this ferocious storm. It was a tough night, but by the morning, it's over. Now we have to get back to work, which means getting to the bottom of the crater, poor visibility or not. Sarah isn't joining me on my descent today, as last night's storm took away her valuable research time. The goal is to get all the way to the bottom, 1,200 feet, gather some rock samples for Sarah, and get some thermal imagery of the lava lake itself. Big day today. Rock and roll. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Just the sound of the lava lake below. It's wild. I've described it to people as sounding like the devil's washing machine. <laughs> and you don't want to end up in that spin cycle. The biggest danger is rock fall. If you knock a rope, rock comes down, hits your buddy in the head, you're dead meat. trick is slow and steady, nice and safe, because anything and everything can go wrong here. At the summit, Sarah is measuring how much carbon dioxide is being emitted from the soil. As long as a volcano is active, it's emitting gases. The carbon dioxide migrates through cracks to the soil on the side of the volcano. The levels of CO2 found will help Sarah in her analysis of whether volcanoes are leading to climate change. 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. I'm getting really high values. I want to see how it compares to measurements up on the crater side and getting closer and closer to the Caldera Rim. It takes me two grueling hours to make it down to the bottom of the crater. Top side, I am free of the rope. Okay, we're gonna get our first look at this thing up close. Wow. This is liquid rock. The heat is just unbelievable right now. It's burning the back of my neck. Lava lakes are a rare phenomenon. 
formed when molten lava becomes trapped in a volcanic crater. First things first, I'm gonna get some thermal images. Examining thermal images helps us understand more about the volcano and its activity. Unless you've actually experienced lava firsthand, it's hard to comprehend just how hot it is. Normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The average oven reaches 450 degrees Fahrenheit. 1,200 Fahrenheit. This is a whole other level of heat. 1,400, 1,600, 1,697. Holy cow. I gotta be careful, I'm definitely within the splash zone. Even the smallest piece of flying lava could burn through my clothes and skin. Ah, it's burning. <laughs> All this ejecta coming out of the lava lake are very fresh, so that should be perfect for what Sarah needs. I just gotta grab a couple of fresh samples and watch my back at the same time. It's really scary turning your back on this thing. This really fine stuff is Pele's hair. When the bubbles on the lava lake burst, they form these tiny little hairs and they'll drift all the way up to camp. I can get a little bit closer, but I'm gonna have to put on my special heat suit. It's a good thing I came prepared. This suit can withstand temperatures up to 3,000 degrees. I think I'm ready. If you want to get a really good view, you have to be protected. Otherwise, the radiant heat is just too much. Wow. That is about as crazy as it gets. My big concern right now is watching for pieces of lava splashing up. Wow. There's some big pieces coming. Big pieces coming. I can't leave before collecting some samples for Sarah. Oh, here we go. Here's a really fresh piece, still glowing hot. Oh. Ah. Ah, even with the gloves. Today was a success. Got up close, got some really good samples, some good thermal data. The newly formed lava samples will give us the most accurate results about their chemical makeup and indicate the quantity and types of gases being emitted. This will help Sarah determine if volcanoes are contributing to climate change. It's just, really, it's not like anywhere else. This pit, expect the devil himself to come jumping out of it. I got some goodies for you. These are the ones that were fresh out of the volcano. They were so hot. So this is the newest rock on Earth. You want it fresh? I got you fresh. We've now collected data from the summit and straight from the lava lake in the crater. If this volcano is having any effect on climate change, we'll have the numbers to prove it. We've spent the last few days on this volcano gathering data to help investigate the claim that volcanoes contribute to climate change. Now, it's the moment of truth. What you got? I'm looking at some of the data, mm -hmm. and I've summed it up. First, Sarah analyzes the carbon dioxide readings she took from the soil surrounding the volcano. How much gas is it emitting? The carbon dioxide is of around 21,000 tons a day. 21,000 tons of day just from here, yeah? Yes, from the Ambrum. Next, Sarah adds up the sulfur dioxide emissions she took at the summit to see how much Ambrum is releasing. The volcano here is emitting around 7,800 tons a day. It's a lot of sulfur dioxide. But to get a clear answer, Sarah needs to add the sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide results to the data that's being collected from other volcanoes around the world. Total volcanic budget, global, that's 0 0.26 gigatons a year. So it's quite a lot. But most importantly, how does that compare to human activity? Human activity is 35 gigatons a year. 35 gigatons? Yes. Versus 0.2 for all volcanoes combined. Yes. So do volcanoes contribute to global warming? I think you're going to say no. No. Definitely no, no. it doesn't. <laughs> we have the numbers to prove it. Yes. In fact, according to data collected by scientists around the world, the sulfur dioxide gas being released here can actually help the planet. 
the gas forms tiny droplets of sulfuric acid, also known as volcanic aerosols, which block sunlight, and that causes the climate to cool. After large eruptions like Mount Pinatubo, Mount St. Helens, detectable drops in temperature were found around the world due to sulfur dioxide and other aerosols in the atmosphere from these eruptions. Even with all this unimaginable heat, power, and gas that comes out of not just this volcano, but all the world's volcanoes, the amount of greenhouse gas that comes out of them only amounts to about 1% of the total greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Whew. The rest comes from us. Volcanoes are not to blame. We have volcanoes to thank. At any given time, there are dozens of volcanoes erupting on Earth. But reports coming from the remote island of Fogo off the coast of Africa are especially alarming. A river of molten lava is advancing on one of its villages. How far will it go? The answer could be the difference between life and death for its residents. I know firsthand how volcanoes behave. I've rappelled deep into exploding fiery craters and explored up close many of the world's most active volcanoes. To understand what's happening in Cabo Verde, I have to go and see it for myself. Wow! I'm on my way to Cabo Verde, cluster of 10 volcanic islands off the coast of West Africa. Santiago is the largest of the islands. From there, I'll travel to the island of Fogo, where its namesake volcano is erupting furiously. The last eruption on Fogo happened in 1995. 1,300 people were forced to flee their homes in the middle of the night as lava flowed through their houses and blocked the only road access to the town of Portela. Will the damage be as severe this time? Reports suggest it might actually be worse. Once in Santiago, I meet up with local guide Simon Levy to get up to speed on what's happened since the volcano started erupting just one week ago. What are they saying about the situation? The situation uh, is bigger than the last eruption in 1995. And this eruption could end tomorrow, or it could go for months. The people there and here also is all in panic, so they don't know what will happen, so that's the problem. Wow, there is some concern that this whole area will be filled. Yes, because the uh, Santa Caldera, the volcano is higher, so all the small villages around, down, yeah. so the lava just goes to the goes, lowest point and, and fills yeah. up. I need to get up there for myself and see where this lava is going and provide my assessment to emergency officials. With the Fogo airport closed, I have to travel by ferry. Sorry. Squeeze on through. And I'm not the only one. Emergency aid workers are also making their way to the island. Looks like we're starting to line up now. The people that are evacuating from Fogo are just getting off of the ferry now, and hopefully soon, within the hour, I'll be on the boat and on my way. Hopefully. It's a four-hour ferry ride from Santiago to Fogo. Our trek to the volcano starts in Sao Felipe, the island's main city. From here, we'll need to drive up and into the volcano's caldera, the lowlands surrounding the volcano's peak, where the village of Portela is located. So far, the lava has reached the border of the town, steamrolling entire buildings as it moves forward. I've run into Patrick Barois. He's from France. He's a very, very experienced volcanophile, been all over the world. He was here in 1995 for the big eruption there, and he'd written five books about volcanoes. Yes, so what yes. was it like here during 1995? There was big lava flow, big explosion, big lava fountain. But this eruption mm -hmm. is not the same, because this eruption is more dramatical, because the lava flow now has destroyed the, the ground, the, the villages. The villages. It's a problem to build a house in, in this kind of volcano because it is the house of the volcanoes and the volcano decide himself what to do. Right. People that build in there, they're basically building on the volcano's land, the volcano's yes. property, yes. and they're living on borrowed time by building in yes. there. By reaching the volcano, I'm hoping to see the lava flow's direction and get some insight as to whether or not it'll flow past Portela 
and into the village of Bangiera. It doesn't take long to hit roadblock number one. All the other alternative roads to go inside, it's completely destroyed. So that's the reason they stopped, because Portela village is completely covered with the lavas at the moment. This is one of the villages where the people who've been evacuating from the, basically the destroyed towns, have been setting up shop. <laughs> Things are getting a little heated here. There are tents, there's food, there's water, but it's crowded. There's uh, only one toilet for the whole facility, so some of the people are not too pleased. The people who live here feel they're not being listened to and their needs are being ignored. They're extremely vulnerable, forced to live in the shadow of a volcano in order to take advantage of the rich soil this dangerous corner of the earth offers. Part of Portela is already hit. Hopefully, the lava will stop before more damage is done. Let's get up to, of course, where we can. How many lives are in danger? I've got to keep moving if I'm going to find out. Visibility is so bad, you can't see anything. <laughs> As the volcano is erupting, it's releasing carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. While these emissions don't have a huge impact on climate change, the combination of these gases can be lethal for people, animals, and vegetation. As we head towards Portela, we drive through barren land that until recently was thriving with agriculture, an important part of Fogo's economy. Despite the dangers of growing in close proximity to the volcano, more and more people are settling here because there's nowhere else for them to scratch out a living on the island. All right. I finally come face to face with what I've come here to see, the river of lava. So this is the brand new lava flow. It's uh, probably a couple of days old. It's not hot. It's warm. The sky is starting to clear up a little bit, so I'm kind of enthusiastic about that because I can hear the vent. The lava is erupting right now. Well, the peak of the volcano is there above the cloud, but this eruption was not at the summit. This eruption was actually down a fissure eruption along the flanks on the side. Volcanic fissure eruptions occur in cracks or fractures along the side of a volcano, rather than through the main cone or vent. It's definitely still active. It's hard to hear, but it's definitely going on just behind those clouds. Think of this lava flow as a snake. Anything? The tail is a mile and a half behind us at the base of the volcano. If this is the body, where's the head? We need to get to the very front of this lava flow. Reports suggest it's in Portela. Let's go. But who knows what we'll find when we get there. Fresh lava, let's go. Lava's moving. It's moving. That's each one hour. Let's do it. Three days ago, you could keep driving right to Portela. But unfortunately for us, this fast-moving river of lava passed through, leaving a wall of solid rock in its wake. This used to be the road to the town of Portela, but for some reason, they can't use it anymore. Literally, the end of the road. A construction crew is further up the hill trying to build a new road so the town has access again, but it's gonna take some time. Giving up and turning around isn't an option. So we abandon our vehicle and hike the rest of the way. I need to get to the front of Fogo's lava flow for a sense of where it's going next. We had to abandon the car because this road 
it's not safe anymore to take a car onto because it could disappear very, very quickly. Right now, we're at the base of the volcano. The molten lava is flowing from its side and traveling right into town. It's a huge threat to everyone who lives there. I'm actually at the point where this lava flow is actually on top of the old lava flow from 1995. So you've got stacked flows together. And there's pieces tumbling down here. This whole thing is moving. When a volcano erupts, all that lava, along with ash, rock fragments, and gases, are ejected into the atmosphere. While the gases will eventually dissipate, the volcanic material will settle and cool on the ground. Eventually, that material will break down and become young, fertile soil, containing many of the same elements found in commercial fertilizers. This can take anywhere from a decade to 100 years. Climate is the single most important factor for soil development. Tropical climates, like Cabo Verde's, help speed up this process. The volcanic soil on Fogo is perfect for harvesting vegetables, coffee beans, and wine grapes. For farmers, the benefits outweigh the risks. Finally, we've made it to Portela, or what's left of it. Until a few days ago, this whole area was covered in vineyards, producing export quality wine. But the eruption has completely buried the most lucrative vineyards. Now, all that's left is a field of lava and a few drops of wine. So this is the last wine that was produced here. It's produced here. It's the very last batch. There will never be any more like this. Oh, that's very strong. That's good. We knew the town had been hit, but nothing could have prepared us for this. And it's not close to being over. It's almost unimaginable what's happening here. This unstoppable wall of hot rock is just steamrolling into the town of Portales. I'm up on a hill right now overlooking, and I got a really good view of how vast this lava flow is. And it just goes as far as the eye can see, and it's just pushing into the town. There is almost no chance for most of these buildings to survive. Locals are trying to save as much as they can. They've removed doors, windows, furniture, and carried everything up the side of the hill where they pray the lava won't reach. So where was her house? So the house is, uh, is over, cover, completely covered, covered and, covered. and uh, everything, all stuff inside. Uh, she didn't have time to take out. The people of Portela have not only lost their homes, they've lost their livelihoods. It's absolutely devastating. Hard to put into words, this unstoppable lava flow is, it's in town right now. This is the head of the beast I've been chasing across the island. If I want to get close enough to analyze this lava, I need my heat resistant suit. It can protect me from temperatures of up to 2000 degrees. Now what this suit does is it protects me from the radiant heat. What it does not protect me from is the actual rocks, <laughs> these avalanches of lava chunks. So the lava here is, is actually a little bit more fluid than in the other part of town. <sighs> as soon as I touch my hammer to the lava, it just immediately bursts into flames. Even with the suit, that is unbearably hot. It's burning my ear. Ow! Ow! I'm using an infrared thermometer. Lava can reach temperatures up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I've gone off the scale. This lava must be hotter than the 1,000 degrees that this thermometer can read. Off the scale. OK, that's useless. Evacuation of these homes began as soon as the volcano first erupted. Oh, wow. Oh, jeez. Holy smokes. Less than a week ago, the family who lived here was forced to evacuate in the middle of the night, taking with them whatever they could carry. The glass is broken. The door is hot. Wow, more glass coming through. 
very, very soon, this wall is gonna just completely come crashing in. I don't think this lock is gonna hold it for much longer. It sounds like rain or hail outside, but it's actually rocks coming in. Wow. That was uh, something. I may have just avoided death by steamrolling hot lava. Even though the lava appears to be moving relatively slowly, it's actually moving at 100 feet an hour. It would take it under three hours to cross a football field. That's fast. In four days, the lava has destroyed just about everything in this town. And by the end of the week, another town will be in the lava's path. To me, it blows my mind how we all live on this thin skin, this crust on top of the Earth. If you were to shrink the Earth down to the size of an apple, the crust that we live on would be about as thick as the skin on that apple. And everything else inside is basically this. Civilization exists because of geological permission, which is revocable at any time. I don't know how we do it. It's amazing. It's the reason volcanoes are so closely monitored. Except poor countries don't always have the resources and latest technologies to observe them as carefully as they'd like to. This really is a world problem. While it's too late for Portela, other towns on the island are still at risk. So for now, my biggest concern is just how far this lava flow can go. And for that, I've got to get closer to the source. And I've just met a local who might be my ticket to the top. It flies up about 600 feet and then it comes down, so it cools off on the way down. Yeah, but, but it's still enough in instant. I mean, it goes like this. We thought the whole place was gone. How gone difficult is it to get there? About 10 minutes. So you can drive right up to a point and then yeah, walk for 10 course. minutes? Yeah, I got my car right over here. I love you. There's tons of seismic activity. Yeah. This area is not stable. I mean, absolutely not. Just it's very, very, very quiet right now. But they do not know if the, it's going to blow or not. I'm trying to help these guys get rid of their wines. I had a few glasses. I mean, <laughs> they ain't going to be able to pump all of it up. So I'm okay. going up there in a little while. It takes about, got about an hour walk back to the car. Yeah. But the twilight hour is the best. I see the smoke and yeah. the flames. Yeah. I so mean, it gets dark, you don't see the I mean, if we can follow you. Sure, no so I've met up with this very odd dude whose name is Vince, and he says that he can get me up to the vent. So I'm going to trust him and follow him right now and see if we can get up there. It's starting to get dark, so we should be able to see that real incandescence coming up from the volcano. So I don't know how this is going to work out, but uh, <laughs> stay tuned. We'll see. Vince knows the roads of this island like the back of his hand. He usually leads fishing charters, but tonight he's guiding us as close to the eruption as possible. Then we'll have to hike the rest of the way. Hopefully getting this close to the source will get me the answers I'm looking for. Now that night has fallen, I can clearly see that there's almost continuous explosions going on on the flank of the volcano. There's actually two very vigorous vents and a lava flow coming down the side. It's a little hard to see still, but that just means I have to get a bit closer. All right, folks. The really big lava flow, that's what's heading down into the towns. But higher up, the explosive part of the eruption, to me, it looks like there's too much lava for these explosions, so I think there's some lava tube or something below, further down the mountain, that's feeding these lava flows. Lava tubes are formed when the top of lava flows harden and forms a roof above it. It acts like a tunnel and drains the lava from the volcano. This may mean the threat is greater than I thought, and many more communities could be at risk, starting with the neighboring town of Banguera. Every time there's an explosion, I can feel the shock wave and the ground shaking. This is what's called a Strombolian eruption, named after the active Stromboli volcano in Italy. It spews lava at regular intervals. You can see these lava bombs shooting up just hundreds and hundreds of yards up in the air and tumbling down the side. These glowing chunks of lava are being pushed out at high pressure from these expanding gases deep inside the Earth. I've got to be careful. There have been a few close ones. A light show like this, it's nature's fireworks. It really is the best show on Earth. However, at the same time, if you're downhill of one of these things and the lava flow is coming for your village or your house, 
it's hard to appreciate the beauty. Since the volcano first erupted 10 days ago, more than a thousand people have fled their homes. Entire communities lost under hardened lava. Let me tell you, what a difference a day makes. Yesterday, I was inside this building as the lava flow came crashing through the door. Today, <laughs> the entire building is completely destroyed by this lava flow. The good news is that it has stopped for now. I can still hear in the distance the volcano erupting, so it could restart at any time. We don't know exactly what the future is going to hold for this town. The economic impact is enormous. Destroyed homes, lost livelihoods, less land available for agriculture. Many of the refugees will not be coming back. But fast forward 10, 20, 30 years from now, and this land will once again offer up the nutrient-rich soil that will attract a new wave of farmers. So, despite the risk of future eruptions, the people of Fogo will eventually rebuild their communities within the caldera. It is, after all, the only option they have. Within months of leaving the island, we get word that the volcano continued to erupt, and as feared, destroyed the neighboring town of Bangueira. Months after the first eruption, it's not showing any signs of stopping. A hundred years ago, three men died on the trip we're about to take. We're retracing a hundred-year-old expedition on one of the world's most dangerous rivers. It's getting ready to bolt. The Amazon jungle was once a mighty foe for explorers. But has logging and climate change made it any less wild? We've explored many corners of this earth, but none are more endangered and more important to the health of our planet than the Amazon rainforest. I'm about to follow in the footsteps of a legendary US president to find out how serious the problem is. I'll have some company on this adventure. My friend, travel writer Kristen Sarah, will document this journey on her blog. The smaller the plane, the bigger the adventure. So we're on our way to a remote landing strip deep in the Amazon jungle, a place on the Rio Roosevelt, which is a river that was named after Teddy Roosevelt himself. It was 1914, three years after his second term as president, when he embarked on an expedition to explore an uncharted river deep in the Amazon jungle. It was a trip that very nearly killed him. They faced raging rapids, wild animals. They lost boats, supplies. They went hungry. Three members of his expedition didn't make it out alive. What better way of gauging the mood of the area than by retracing the most dangerous part of that expedition to see this untamed land for myself? It's truly amazing just to see how big the jungle is from this point of view. Not only is it the largest rainforest in the world, it is also known as the lungs of the world because it produces 20% of the world's oxygen. The Amazon is just so incredibly vast, there's plenty of spots that we've flown over that have been completely clear cut. In the last 20 years, it's lost over 295,000 square miles of forest. That's as big as two Germanys. Because of all that logging and the use of the slash and burn method, the downed trees are releasing the carbon dioxide they've absorbed back into the atmosphere, which results in more global warming. All right, we made it. Deforestation is far from the only threat to the region. Huge parts of it are drying up because of drought. That's a direct result of climate change. The forest isn't producing the water vapor, which forms the clouds that put the rain in the rainforest. All right, this is so dense. We're making our way to a point in the river where Roosevelt and his men started the hardest part of their expedition. 
It was a gutsy journey. We're going to duplicate part of it to find out how climate change has altered this once wild jungle. So what do you do if you're the president of the United States? You've already served two terms. You tried to go back for a third, was unsuccessful. Do you retire? Just fade away? Not if you're Roosevelt. He came down to the Amazon and did a kick-ass expedition in one of the wildest places on Earth. I mean, that guy was the most badass president of all time. He had a pet badger. He carried a gun in the White House. He got shot in the chest in an assassination attempt and got on stage and gave a 90-minute speech. Complete badass. In Roosevelt's day, the environment was so hostile that he lost a few boats along the way. It would be one of the thrills of my lifetime to actually find a boat from that remarkable expedition. Our location is right here. The Rio Roosevelt flows to the north. It's 400 miles long, with many sections that are completely impassable. We know boats were lost while navigating the rapids, so we're going to concentrate our search at a bend in the river where a lost boat would likely wash up. Torrential downpours are on the horizon as rainy season gets underway. We have no time to lose. The power of these rapids is incredible. That's where Roosevelt lost one of his men. It doesn't take much to get swept into the rapids which is exactly what happened to one of Roosevelt's crew members. His body was never even found. Oh, this is just way too dangerous. Yeah, We're just going to get smashed to bits. I don't want to be searching for your boat, and I don't want you searching for my I boat. I don't want to be searching for your body, either. Motorboats only go so far here. That's why we're going to portage past the rapids, then kayak the next leg of the river. The rapids are so powerful. I can actually feel the ground shaking. One, two, three. Tough slogging, and our kayak only weighs 50 pounds. Roosevelt's boats weighed 800. Look at this. Wow. That is crazy. Just looking at these rapids, absolutely wicked, strong, very dangerous. Scares the hell out of me. It's not the kind of place you want to fall in. So much power. It just makes sense to portage around this. For us, yeah, it's tough. But for the guys years ago, this would have been a multi-day effort. Cutting down trees, using logs as rollers. They had it hard, really hard. I just lost my footing there for a second. When you're along the water, especially with these rocks, it's really easy to get trapped in here, kind of like I am right now. This is not serious, but when Roosevelt was here, he actually got his leg smashed between rocks and a canoe. That wound plagued him for the entire expedition, and some even think it contributed to his death. There we go. Ready to pop it in? Yeah. There are innumerable rapids down this river. Sometimes you have to portage, carry your boats across land. Sometimes you can put the boat in the water and line it down by rope. This is an easier way to do it, isn't it? Absolutely. We'll just haul it up here. All right. Perfect. Nice parallel park. We're past the worst of it, so let's see if we can do the next section the way Roosevelt did, paddling down the raging river. We just got our first taste of what Roosevelt was up against. Luckily, Kristen recovers quickly. Roosevelt hurt me! You got too cocky. Back on track. Only two more miles to go, and we can start searching the bend in the river. There's a fishing lodge up there where we can get back into motorboats and make some real progress. 
We've done our research, and we've narrowed down the location. That way. We're on our way to the bend where the current could have carried one of Roosevelt's boats. A depth finder and an underwater camera are part of our search arsenal. We are gonna put this underwater metal detector to work. I'm hoping it'll detect any of the boat's iron nails or fittings. Sometimes though, the best way to search in the water is to get right in. Can you pass me the metal detector? Yep. for that sound. <laughs> of course, there are all kinds of things living in the water here. Electric eels, flesh-eating piranhas, and the tiny blood-sucking candiru fish. It's been known to actually swim up your urethra if you pee in the water. Got anything? Not yet. Not yet. Want to know a little secret? I'm peeing right now. I mean, what's your choice? I'm not doing it. I survived. <laughs> For now. No luck quite yet. Back in the boat. That's how you do it. Let's move the search a little further north. In Roosevelt's day, he would have encountered a lot of wildlife. The biggest is the local crocodilian species, the black caiman. That's a big one. And wouldn't you know it, he's right where we want to search. Black caiman are the apex predator of the Amazon. An adult caiman really has nothing to fear out here except for humans. It's got good reason to fear us. Just 50 years ago, this king of the river was hunted almost to extinction. Over the last 100 years, its population has decreased by 99% all for its high-quality skin, which produces shiny black leather. Caimans feed on fish, like piranha and catfish, and mammals, like the capybara, the largest rodent in the world. As caiman numbers decline, their prey thrives. The growing number of capybaras are destroying vegetation and crops. Hunting caimans is now illegal, and their population is slowly recovering. So, it's encouraging to come across a fully grown caiman out here. Getting a little closer. So he's gonna feel trapped, we should back up. <sighs> These animals can't seem to catch a break though. Their new enemy is drought. North of here, caiman populations are down again as water levels drop. I'd love to get a better look at this guy. At the same time, let's lure him away from our search site by offering him some lunch. Downriver. There's a big caiman right where we want to conduct the search for Roosevelt's long lost boat. So, we're trying to lure him away. It takes a few hours to convince the caiman to clear out, and now we're losing daylight. We'll set up camp here for the night, but first, I want to install our stealth cam to get a sense of the state of the wildlife here. This spot looks pretty good. Check this out, there's all kinds of tracks and activity. We have a hoof print here. Might have been a deer. Look, green banded moss. So beautiful. The Amazon basin contains so much biodiversity that 10% of all of the Earth's species are found here. There are some amazing animals I'd love to catch sight of, especially one of the world's rarest big cats, the jaguar. Any warm-blooded creature that comes by here will get picked up by the infrared sensor. All right, wildlife, anytime. Show us something. This spot here is totally flat enough. I'll stick up my tent right here. Here you go. Just one little fire. It's 
about uh, 20 after 5 in the morning. I'm going to go check on our cameras. Some people say it's insane to camp out here because of the threat of jaguars. They can hide and ambush you very, very quickly. They have been known to kill people. Needless to say, I'll make this a quick check. Okay, we've got a brocket deer and a Brazilian tapir. Both prey for the jaguar. But so far, no jaguar. They need huge amounts of territory to thrive, so they've been hit hard by habitat loss. There are now 80% fewer jaguars than when Roosevelt was here. Jaguar footprints. Holy smokes, those are huge. That's incredible. Must have come down to take a drink. You see it stepped and then dragged its claws. Oh, yeah. And that's not the only wildlife this beach has to offer this morning. These weaver birds make the most intricate nests. Hello, Mr. Tarantula. So how is climate change going to potentially affect the Amazon jungle? Well, it's hard to say. But a 2009 study suggested that as little as a three degree rise in temperature could destroy up to 75% of the rainforest. And that's combined with deforestation, which not only destroys the area being logged, it also increases soil erosion and degrades rivers. Bad for the rainforest and bad for the wildlife that lives in it. Our quest continues. Based on Roosevelt's notes, we've searched up and down this bend. One of the only places left is off this beach. I'm using a glass-bottomed bucket. Simple, but effective. Nothing yet. Do you know how deep it is here? Do you have the depth sounder? 10 feet. Our research tells us we're close, but there's no sign of it in the river. But. What about land that was underwater 100 years ago? This sandbar is the only place left to look. Because the water level is so incredibly low right now, it could be exposed maybe just under a few feet of sand. Time to pull out some shovels and start digging. Oh. Right here. There's definitely something buried here. Here come the rain clouds. This is exactly what we fear. It could rain for days, and this sandbar will be submerged again. We've got to keep digging. It doesn't look like this rain is going to let up. It's discouraging to get this far and think, I won't even have the chance to find the trophy I'm looking for, the legendary Theodore Roosevelt's lost boat. We're calling it a day and hoping nature is on our side tomorrow. We've looked high and low around the rapids and found nothing. The only reasonable place left to search is the sandbar. The metal detector was pinging, so I feel good about our chances here. I recruit some locals to help. We're gonna be here digging forever. Yeah. Something? Something wood? Hey! Oh, yeah! We must have dug a dozen different holes on this beach, and finally we've come across it looks like a boat. Well, it looks like a boat, so it looks really, really promising. Really big. Yeah, it's definitely it a boat. It seems like it's really big. It's definitely a boat. This really looks like a dugout canoe. Yeah. <laughs> the boats on the Roosevelt expedition were made from a single tree trunk, split in half and hollowed out. They measured about 10 feet long. Oh, lightheaded. I think we might have found Jimmy Hoffa and Amelia Earhart, and D.B. Cooper. We've got most of this boat excavated. 
Let's see if we can at least give it a budge. Ah. Ow. Awesome. The good news and the bad news. The good news is we found a boat against all odds. The bad news is this boat is much too new. It's been painted. There's no way they would have painted their boats. This is an old fishing boat that got washed up here during the rainy season. Yeah, we might as well pull it out of here. One, two, three. We have a boat. <laughs> well, this may not have been the boat we were looking for, but it's still pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's here along the river where he was. Looks like a dugout canoe, but not the right vintage. And the boat, Roosevelt's boat, is still out there. We've searched the entire bend. Now, the wet season is approaching and river levels are rising. If we want to find Roosevelt's boat, it'll have to wait another year. Of all the American presidents, Theodore Roosevelt was the most passionate about saving the environment. During his presidency, he protected over 230 million acres of public land, including 150 national forests and five national parks. So, is the Amazon tamer than in Roosevelt's day? It's hard to say. We faced many of the same challenges he did 100 years ago. What's different? Today, the rainforest is suffering the effects of human activity through deforestation and climate change. Great strides have been made to reverse the damage, but it'll take a lot more effort to make sure this remains one of the wildest places on Earth. Oceans are our lifeblood. Covering 71% of the planet, they produce more than half the oxygen in the atmosphere. But now, the oceans are becoming a danger to us. Sea levels worldwide have been rising as a result of climate change. A lot is at stake, especially for the Pacific nation of Tuvalu. If the ocean continues to rise, it's at risk of being completely submerged. Will Tuvalu be the first country to be wiped off the map by climate change? Our oceans are vast, spanning two-thirds of the planet and accounting for 97% of our water. But now, our seas have become monsters because of climate change. As a storm chaser and adventurer, I've spent years traveling all over the world documenting the most extreme forces of nature. But now, I'm going after the bigger picture of climate change. In the last five years, I've witnessed increasingly violent storms, flooding, and hurricanes that have devastated communities in Thailand, the Philippines, and the USA. More and more, I'm seeing that much of our extreme weather is directly connected to climate change. Scientists agree that oceans are getting hotter and higher, making them unpredictable and dangerous. The last 12 months have brought some really bad news in terms of sea level rise. It's just rising fast. Now it's 3.2 millimeters a year. Places like, like Tuvalu and the Pacific Islands, the low-lying atoll countries, are in real trouble. I mean, they will go under the sea. At some point this century, they'll go underwater. I'm on my way to the tiny island nation of Tuvalu to investigate this firsthand. Located in the Pacific Ocean, midway between Australia and Hawaii, Tuvalu is a cluster of nine islands. My arrival here in Tuvalu is ominous. There's torrential rain and the whole area is flooded. This is the wet season and we're in an area that's a South Pacific convergent zone where you've got different wind currents coming together, which then go up creating rain and thunderstorms and tremendous amounts of flooding it seems. With only 10 square miles of dry land, Tuvalu is one of the smallest countries in the world. An average elevation of six feet makes Tuvalu extremely vulnerable to storms and sea level rise. The rains are incredible. All over the island, people are struggling to keep their homes dry. Usually when this place floods out, it's from the sea, which is about 30 yards that way. Today, torrential thunderstorms, freshwater flooding. This island can't catch a break. 
I meet with local meteorologist Tuala Katea. So it's, it's been a busy 24 hours for you. You've never seen this much rain no. in 24 hours. And we measure around 340, 47 millimeter in one day. That sounds like something you'd get That's on a history. mountainside in a cyclone. That's history. And it's not linked to any tropical cyclone or what. I mean, it's just a rain band, a convention zone, really active, right on top of two. Right, just perfectly aligned right on top of the island for yes. hours and hours yes, and hours. Yes. Tuvalu experiences seasonally high tides that the locals call king tides. But in the last few years, these tides have been changing. We call it king tides. That's the normal high tide. The normal high tide, but it's higher than normal. If the king tide was yesterday, combined with the oh, storm and the flooding, oh, and maybe oh, some, a little yes. bit of surge from the storm, yes. that oh. would be catastrophic. Yes, yes, of course. Because of our elevation, it's really low. So low-lying places and um, coastal areas get inundated and eroded. It's not just you that's being affected, mm. it's everyone else. It just so happens that your island is very low. Yes. So it's gonna be seen here first. We are the front line. Tuvalu has few natural defenses against these high tides. One thing the locals have done is to try and help prevent the king tides by putting these barrels filled with concrete. Of course, not really working so well here. A few of them in knocked down during a storm. The concept seems sound, but the implementation, I don't know. The island can barely cope with tropical downpours, let alone more storms. This one has finally passed, but the damage on the island is long-lasting. Yesterday, there was some torrential rain, like I haven't seen in a long, long time anywhere. And some of the houses here are actually flooded out by that. It's not just seawater they have to worry about here. It's rainwater as well. So this place got totally flooded out yesterday. Yeah, starting at 8 o'clock last night, the water started coming in, and the family were totally sleeping. They didn't know what was happening till the neighbors called right. out. So around about 8, the water was all over here, going inside. It was flooded everywhere. Let's take a look. Wow. Everything is up on tables. This is the first time that they have experienced this and have been evacuated. They just put up everything that are useful for the family, um, like the refrigerators and everything are put up high. Where did they end up going? They went up to the Tuvalu Red Cross. Like many of the houses in Tuvalu, this house is located only 160 feet from the shore. So could you imagine, with 5,000 or so people on this island, a major catastrophe? If we have a two meters uh, high king tide, it will just destroy us all. The global sea level has been rising at a rate of 0.14 inches per year since the early 1990s, roughly twice the average speed of the preceding 80 years. It's a dangerous scenario. In the last century, the planet's temperature has risen at an alarming rate. Scientists have shown that human activities are driving temperatures up with our reliance on fossil fuels that emit greenhouse gases. As those gases trap more energy from the sun, oceans absorb more heat and expand. Climate scientists predict global temperatures will increase by 2 to 11 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Higher temperatures are also leading to increased melting of glaciers and polar ice caps resulting in greater runoffs into the ocean and increasing sea levels. I asked climate scientist Elizabeth Holland more about the data. We looked at solar radiation. We looked at rising sea level. We looked at the temperature of the oceans. We looked at the temperature of the atmosphere. We looked at the temperature of the land. Warming is unequivocal. We've been able to say more and more strongly that humans are causing the warming. As ocean surface temperatures heat up, scientists predict an increase in the number of intense storms. The islands of Tuvalu are so low-lying and small, only 400 yards at the widest point, that they could easily be submerged. This is basically it. I'm surrounded by ocean on three sides of me, with just a tiny spit of land connecting me to the island. Probably the most vulnerable point on one of the most vulnerable islands. You've got the lagoon side over here and the ocean side here. It's all converging on this one tiny spit. One thing that scientists are certainly in agreement about is that 
a lot of the heat that's trapped by greenhouse gases is getting absorbed by the ocean. Let's see how warm the ocean is today. Okay, so just over 80 degrees. As the water heats up, it will expand, and that actually contributes to global sea level rise. But that 80 degree point, that's sort of the threshold for tropical cyclone formation. You need water of at least that warm, and we've certainly got it here. Such a low-lying island is really at risk for not only sea level rise, but the torrential storm surge flooding that you can get during tropical cyclone season. I tell you, I wouldn't want to be standing right here during one. Increased sea temperatures can have devastating consequences across the globe. Rising oceans are one of the deadliest results of climate change. Warm water is the fuel for hurricanes, typhoons, tropical cyclones. And the warmer the seawater, the more we're going to see of these storms, and particularly the strength of these storms. A low-lying island like Tuvalu is particularly at risk. Today, we've got just a regular stormy day, and already this wind-driven surge is causing tremendous waves to crash much higher than the regular high tide. So to be on this island during a cyclone, it would totally swamp the island. And they do get cyclones here. Across the globe, we're already witnessing increasingly violent storms. But what we can now say absolute, with absolute clarity is that climate change is a very strong influence on these extreme weather events, and in some cases, the strongest influence. It's not just low-lying islands that are vulnerable to hurricanes. New York City, which is only 33 feet above sea level, was brought to a standstill by Hurricane Sandy. I was in New York for Sandy, and even though I've been an active storm chaser for over 15 years, it was one of the most intense storms I've ever experienced. The storm surge during Sandy was 13 feet above normal. It was one of the most devastating and expensive natural disasters in U.S. history. 117 people were killed, and it cost the U.S. $65 billion. It created an unprecedented surge for that part of the world. 51 square miles of the city were flooded. That's 17% of the city landmass. More than 440,000 New Yorkers were living in the areas that Sandy flooded. I watched the storm come in from Rockaway Beach. I was able to go up onto the boardwalk, which was maybe 10 feet above the beach, and I knew that the place was going to be completely demolished. I could see the violent waves just churning away, and I knew that the winds were going to shift as the storm got further inland. And that's exactly what happened. We knew we had to get out of there, or else we wouldn't get out of there. I drove to higher ground, but all around me, whole neighborhoods in Queens and Brooklyn were underwater. Such a storm used to only happen about once every 100 years, but now we're seeing these devastating storms more and more often. Only one year later, on the other side of the world in the Philippines, Typhoon Haiyan hit, killing over 6,000 people. Typhoon Haiyan was probably the strongest storm to ever make landfall. It was a Category 5 typhoon that hit the city of Tacloban directly. The storm surge with that was completely devastating. It came in like a tsunami. The Philippines gets hit quite frequently. They're used to typhoons. They've never seen anything like this one. It was so devastating that it was almost beyond comprehension, the level of damage and destruction that was caused by this storm. And I think that as sea levels get warmer and higher, it's inevitable we're putting ourselves at greater risk to the wrath of these marine storms, whether it's a hurricane, a typhoon, a tropical cyclone. They're all feeding off of this warm ocean water. And the sea surface temperatures have just been going up and up and up. It's not a matter of if, but when a major coastal city like Miami or Tampa gets hit by a major hurricane. The danger on Tuvalu isn't just from these massive storms. There's also a serious threat from below. I've come to Tuvalu in the South Pacific to witness firsthand the effects of climate change. For a little bit of perspective, about 80% of the island is no more than four feet above sea level. The highest point being about 15 feet, and about 40% of the population 
lives within 100 yards of the ocean. If there's any place in the world that is at the mercy of the sea, it's this place right here. The rising seas are also forcing farmers to abandon their crops. Salt water from higher tides is soaking through the ground, contaminating the underground source of fresh water and destroying crops. Indigenous food, such as pulaka and coconut, are being destroyed. Reverend Tafui Lusama is deeply concerned with the impact of rising sea levels. If salt water intrudes into it, it kills all our traditional plants. Land and the sea are the sources which sustain our livelihood daily. Um, you lose your land, you lose your life. Tonight, I'm joining the Tira Taula family for a traditional home-cooked meal. But foods like this are becoming harder to harvest. This is a steamed fish. Apple is very hot. Red fruit and uh, banana with talolo, cook with talolo. Local foods may soon be a thing of the past. Treat, enjoy some South Pacific hospitality. <laughs> Going into someone's home, having a home cooked meal. Our well, people can no longer depend on our traditional way of life, so we are left with no option but to turn into a, a market based lifestyle. With traditional crops being threatened by rising oceans, locals are relying on more processed foods. With all of these changes that have been going on, it's become more and more difficult for the farmers here to grow some of the traditional food crops. And especially since World War II, they've become quite dependent on foreign-made processed food. And doesn't really help them in their struggle for food security, which is becoming a big issue here in Tuvalu. The country now imports 80% of its food, which is costly to the islanders. We're Pacific Islanders. We have a lot of ties to our land, our ocean, our identity is very much built around how we relate to our land, how we relate to our ocean, and all of that is threatened, right? People have lived in Tuvalu for 2,000 years, but some islanders are now leaving, scared that climate change and rising sea levels will make life on the island nearly impossible. Our identity as a people will disappear, will die out. If I am relocated, really because of climate change in my country has gone down, where do I belong? I have no roots. Tuvalu is not responsible for the catastrophe it's facing. It's no surprise the largest emitters of man-made greenhouse gases are the world's largest countries, China, United States, the EU, and India. Here in the islands, we, we contribute the least to greenhouse gas emissions, yet we're the most affected. Tuvalu, the fourth smallest country in the world, has almost no carbon emissions, but they're at the front line. As those in the developed world drive their cars and turn up their heat or decide to build one more coal-fired power plant, it is the Tuvalus of the world that will go underwater because of those choices. Environmental activists are taking up the cause, encouraging the people of the Pacific Islands to fight for changes on a local and global scale. In 2014, they took their fight to Australia and blocked the largest coal port with canoes to make their voices heard. Right now, that's the message that we want to get out there. Climate change is real, we are living with it, and sooner or later, the world needs to change if we don't start demanding that the world transitions to more renewable sources of energy. There's no plan B. There's yeah. no plan B, there's no planet B. But Tuvalu is fighting back. In an effort to hold on to their island, the locals have raised money from an unlikely source. Each country has its own internet suffix. .de for Germany, .au for Australia, .ca for Canada. Well, here in Tuvalu, they've got .tv. And .tv has become so popular, especially amongst people in the television world, that it has quite an appeal. The money raised by selling the suffix goes into repairing roads, improving barriers, and planting mangrove trees to fight against coastal erosion. If worse comes to worst, 
and Tuvalu disappears under the waves, that suffix will still exist, creating what could possibly be the world's first virtual country existing only in cyberspace. While Tuvalu is disappearing, it's far from alone in its coastal erosion. The problem is not confined to Tuvalu. It's not peculiar to Tuvalu only. It's a global problem. The Maldives are also under threat. A unique archipelago made up of 2,000 islands could almost disappear into the sea by the end of the century if nothing is done to curb global warming. It's not just low-lying island communities that are at risk. With predictions that sea levels could rise by up to six feet over the next century, South Florida will be badly affected. A three-foot rise would take away a third of the land, and a six-foot rise would submerge half the area. The condos that line Miami's waterfront would disappear. What do you think is the biggest misconception about climate change in general? The biggest misconception is that because it's a slow process, we can wait to take action. Because climate change is a very slow process, but we're at that tipping point. We need to take action today. The people of Tuvalu are desperate for the rest of the world to sit up and pay attention. What does the world need to know about Tuvalu? I think it, it's very important that, um, that we are part of the world. And I think that as a Tuvaluan, Despite how small we are, we need to speak out that we do exist and we are part of who you are, whether you are in Canada or in America. We are all part, we are the people of this world and we need to be together and work together. Just a month after I left Tuvalu, Cyclone Pam tore through the neighboring Pacific islands of Vanuatu, causing extensive damage. It also affected Tuvalu, forcing it to declare a state of emergency. This cyclone is a painful reminder that action must be taken. Global temperatures cannot be allowed to rise another two degrees. If countries around the world can find a way to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, then Tuvalu and other countries in danger will have a fighting chance at survival.